Schneider. I'm his book, Lovelands, Europe Between Hitler and Stalin. My name is Aaron Bezusian. I'm a teacher in the history department, and I'm this year's director of the Marcus Rohr Center for the Humanities. We should begin by just saying that for us in the history department, as well as for many others in the Memphis community, uh, it's been a week uh, where we've been carrying around quite heavy marks. Uh, last week, our colleague, Kate Kriegel, passed away quite suddenly. Dr. Kriegel was a scholar of British history. He was also a very committed teacher, uh, with very rigorous standards. He was a man who believed in conveying important ideas through very clear expression. Uh, he was also a man of the university in the best sense of that word. He was his own man, an independent thinker, a learned thinker, but someone who rejected any notion of the university as a job training program or as an adjunct to a semi-professional basketball team. <laughs> He believed that education was not something to be bought and consumed. It was not to entertain you. It was not to train you for one particular test. It was something to enrich us as a people, as a community, as a nation, as a world. The Marcus Rohr Center for the Humanities stands for those same ideals. In fact, Dr. Kriegel was one of the original founders of the Marcus Rohr Center for the Humanities. And it was very touching to us, as part of the center, that the Kriegel family uh, suggested the Marcus Rohr Center as one of the potential donors uh, for donations in his memory. It was very touching. Mark Rohr Center is dedicated to providing accessible, thought-provoking programming that bridges the university and the community, including tonight's lecture, uh, including some of the lectures we have upcoming. And your program it lists the rest of our events for the spring 2012 season. Let me point out a couple of them. One, on February 23rd, Dr. Eric Foner, one of the leading historians of the United States, he delivered the Velvet Williams Lecture in American History on his book, The Fiery Trial, Abraham Lincoln. In, the, in American slavery. This is a book that has won the Bancroft Prize, the Lincoln Prize, and the Pulitzer Prize in history. Then on March 22nd, Brian Stelter, who is the media reporter for the New York Times, recently featured in the documentary Page One, uh, he'll be delivering the Freedom of Information Congress address. And he'll be talking about how the internet and how social media have transformed journalism. We hope that you'll continue to support the Marcus Source Center for the Humanities. Please look through our program. Please pick, keep, continue picking up our bookmarks, coming to our events. Check out our website, www.memphis.edu slash M-O-C-H. Please sign up to join our email list, where we'll apprise you of upcoming events. Please like us on Facebook, where we'll give you all sorts of links to events pertaining to not only our events, but also to events throughout the Memphis community. It's sort of one-stop shopping on the internet for Memphis intellectual life. And finally, please also consider uh, making a donation. Uh, the Marcus Rohr Center for the Humanities literally cannot exist without public support. So we thank you if you consider that. Before I introduce Dr. Snyder, let me deliver some very important thank yous. The History Department is critical to making this lecture happen. I'd particularly like to thank our chair, Dr. Janan Sherman, and our key administrator, Karen Bradley, and also Dr. Daniel Younes, my colleague, who's been instrumental in bringing Dr. Snyder to campus. And within the Marcus Rohr Center, my associate director, Joe Hayden, our team of crack interns, and the staff at Interdisciplinary Studies, which includes Leela Boyd, Sharon Beasley, and Hope C. Finally, to our speaker. Dr. Timothy Snyder is an internationally educated man, a British Marshall Scholar at the University of Oxford, He's held fellowships in Paris and Vienna, as well as an academy scholarship at Harvard University. Just this month, he was awarded a great honor, an endowed chair at Yale University, the Bird White Housen Professor of History. He's the author of numerous books, which have written great acclaim among his fellow scholars. These books include The Reconstruction of Nations, Sketches from a Secret War, and The Red Prince. Those books, as well as Little Lands, will be available for purchase uh, after, the, uh, after the lecture, and Dr. Snyder will be happy to sign books. There'll be a table set up outside of the lobby. Let me also mention that at the conclusion of Dr. Snyder's lecture, uh, he'll, be, he'll be answering questions. Uh, and I have a handheld microphone that, I'll, that I can bring to you. Simply raise your hand, and I'll bring the microphone to you, and you can ask the questions so that everyone will be able to hear you. Dr. Steyer's most recent book, of course, is Bloodlands, Europe Between Hitler and Stalin. This is a book that's been reviewed and celebrated in the United States, in Great Britain, in Canada, and beyond. It was listed as one of the best books of 2010 by a host of publications, including The Atlantic, The Economist, The New Republic, The Guardian, Reason, and The Forward. Most of this praise stems from its ability to consider this period of mass killing, its region of mass killing, from both the bird's eye and the worm's eye, for its ability to reframe a region's history in light of the pressures from both Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union, and for its capacity to paint a human dimension amid such a wide scale of, of, of brutality. Allow me to quote from just one review. Quote, a talented historian and an accomplished storyteller, 
Snyder expertly negotiates an extremely complex story, debunking myths, correcting misconceptions, and providing context, analysis, and human interest in equal measure, always with a sympathetic ear for the victims themselves. Bloodlands is an excellent, authoritative, and imaginative book, which tells the grim story of the greatest human demographic tragedy in European history with exemplary clarity. Snyder set out to give a human face to the many millions of victims of totalitarianism. He has succeeded at them. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Dr. Timothy Snyder. introduction, you, you, you sink into it and listen, and after a while you forget that it's you who's supposed to speak. <laughs> and then there's this moment of surprise when uh, the, uh, the, the person speaking turns to you and goes, aha, I have to stand up. Thank you very much for this invitation. Um, I'm very glad to be here. What I'd like to do in the next 45 minutes or so is give you a sense of what this book is about that isn't in the book, so a sense of where the book came from and how you might think about it in general terms. <coughs> and, and then a sense of, of, of what the book is about, the chapters and the tragedies that they discuss. So let, let me begin where, where Aaron ended, which is with, with the victims. In the spring of 1933, in Soviet Ukraine, as the soil was beginning to soften, as it was beginning to melt, a Ukrainian man dug his own grave. He dug his own grave because by that point, hundreds of thousands of men, women, and children had already starved to death, and he knew that his turn would come soon. But he dug his own grave chiefly to avoid a certain kind of indignity. When you died of starvation in 1933 in Soviet Ukraine during this planned campaign of starvation of Stalin's, your body would fall by the side of the road or perhaps in a field, and then weekly or every couple of weeks, a cart would come by, a horse sled cart. Your body would be thrown into the back of the cart with all the other corpses and disposed of in a mass grave. So to avoid that indignity, to avoid anonymity, to avoid his, his family, if any, survived, not knowing where his body would be, he dug his own grave. And on a certain day, he found it. In April of 1940, a Polish officer was keeping a diary. Many Polish officers kept diaries. In interwar Poland, everyone who had a university degree was a reserve officer. And so when, when the Germans invaded in 1939 and the Soviets invaded in 1939, essentially the entire university educated population was called up and, and many were killed. This particular Polish officer was being held in a prisoner of war camp by, by the Soviet Union, by the Red Army. And he was keeping a diary day by day, often many entries a day. And at the end, in, in April, he was being led to a place, uh, the name of which he didn't know, but we know it, it was called Katyn. And in the second to last entry, he wrote um, <coughs> of, of, of an encounter with a secret policeman, who soon after that would kill him. He wrote, they asked for my wedding ring, which I, and then it trails off. But it doesn't, it doesn't trail off because the thoughts of his wife and family were, were, were too close or too intimate to record. It trails off for the very simple reason that by that point he knew, or he suspected, what was going to happen to him. Um, he knew that the NKVD officers were going to take his valuables and shoot him. And so he tried to hide his wedding ring. He didn't want to record where it was found. His executioners did, of course, find it, but they left the diary with his body that it would be discovered. In September of 1942, in the West Ukrainian, today the West Ukrainian town of Kolba, a young Jewish woman left a message for her mother. She was trapped with her sisters inside the synagogue of Kolba. By this point in the war, by this late point in the war, by this late point in the events that we know as the Holocaust, she was quite certain of what was about to happen. She knew that she and her younger sisters who were there with her were going to be shot by the Germans and by the local collaborators. 
So she, like several dozen other people in, this, in the Kobol Jewish community, left messages for loved ones by scratching them on the walls of the synagogue with bits of glass or, um, or with knives, whatever, whatever they could find. What the message she left for her mother included, um, we kiss you over and over. These are three of the 14 million people who are the subject of this book. Over the course of just 12 years, between 1933 and 1945, on a relatively small bit of territory, the map of which you have before you, something like 14 million individual men, women, and children were deliberately murdered in campaigns of mass killing. They were all killed in a single time, in a single place, which is my subject. Now, what was this place? It was not an empire. It was not a nation. It's defined simply by this terrible figure, 14 million individuals deliberately killed. This is a number, I hope, I trust, which itself seems to be worthy of attention. There has never been a demographic or moral catastrophe to cite the review that Aaron kindly cited on this scale in modern Europe. These 14 million people, to be clear about this, were not soldiers dying on battlefields. If you include soldiers dying on battlefields, the number roughly doubles. And the reason for that is that, in simple terms of military history, these were also bloodlands. If you look at the entire course of the Second World War, in the Pacific as well as the Atlantic theaters, half of the mortal casualties of war fell also in this very small bit of territory. That's not, so to speak, even my subject. I'm concerned only in the book with the civilians and the prisoners of war who were killed, who totaled 14 million. But this number, so to speak, is also significant in relative terms. It's significant in absolute terms because it's so big, because there are so many individuals contained in that number. But it's also significant in relative terms. If you think about the German Reich and the Soviet Union together, um, territories that go well beyond this map. If you think of them in, say, 1940 or 41 or 42 or 43, the territory they control reaches from the Atlantic to the Pacific. It's a huge swath of Eurasia. It's an enormous percentage of the Earth's surface. On that whole territory, the two regimes killed something like 17 million people deliberately, which, again, is a horribly big number. But what's striking is that of that 17 million, 14 million are in this relatively narrow bit of territory. So clearly there's something special about this place. And one way to think about my book is an attempt to answer the question, what was special? So how else might this place be defined that would help us to answer that question? I've already defined it one way. It's a place where so many people were killed. It's also the place where the Holocaust happened. Of these 14 million individuals, Roughly five and a half million were Jews murdered by the German regime and the people who helped the German regime in the policy that we call the Holocaust. In other words, this map also covers the heartland of historical Jewish settlement in Europe, or for that matter, in the world. Most of the Jewish population of Europe lived precisely here, and all of the Jews who died in the Holocaust, whether or not they lived here, and again, most of them did, were sent to this part of the world to die. So that already brings us to an interesting observation, namely that on the territory where the Holocaust took place, eight million people who were not Jews died, were deliberately murdered, while Hitler was in power. It's a sort of striking juxtaposition which comes to mind right away, and I think is, is worthy of attention, not least because it's never been noticed before which is striking. I'm going to try to say it in a minute why I think that is. The third way to define this territory, the first is numbers, the second is the Holocaust, is this is precisely the territory where both German and Soviet power were present. This is the territory where German power and Soviet power 
overlap. So, of course, there is a good deal of European territory, France, the Low Countries, uh, where German power is present, but Soviet power never is. And there's a huge uh, swath of territory, um, most of Russia, Central Asia, where Soviet power is present, but German power never reaches. And those are not good places to be, don't, don't get me wrong. But um, in those places, the, the scale of death is much, much lower than in these places where German and Soviet power overlap. So we have these three overlapping definitions. And the interesting thing is that these three definitions, where most people are killed, where the two regimes overlap, where the Holocaust happened, give you exactly the same map, the map that you have before you. So, everything that I've said so far, everything I've said so far has just been really geography and arithmetic. Now, admittedly, among us humanists in the 21st century, uh, geography and arithmetic are fairly esoteric branches of knowledge. Um, bringing them both into the picture can be a bit of a challenge. But it, the, the point is that everything I've said so far is really quite straightforward. It's just a matter of maps and numbers. If it is so straightforward, why isn't it common knowledge? Why hasn't what I've said in the last five or ten minutes been said before? And I think the answer has to do with the way that we think about history. I'm going to pose this a different way. If it's true, again to cite the review, which is, I think, correct, that this is the worst moral and demographic catastrophe in the history of modern Europe, which, as I said, I believe it is, why hasn't it been seen as such? I think this has to do with the way that we tend to partition history. Because, of course, we have discussed these events in various different ways. There is, um, there is a history of, let's call it, national suffering or national martyrology of Lithuanian or Polish or Ukrainian suffering at the hands of the Soviets or the Germans. There is a history of Soviet terror written from Moscow outward. And of course, there's a history of the Holocaust and other German crimes, although the Holocaust receives most of the emphasis. These three histories, though, don't really correspond. They don't really communicate with each other very well. It's as though they operate on parallel tracks. They don't touch each other. And the striking thing about their not touching each other is that they happened in the same time and in the same place. And although they affected different people differently, the people who lived in these territories were aware, in one way or another, of all of them. So it's striking that 60 years of history writing can make us, so to speak, unaware of things which were evident to the people who lived there and died there in the time and place. But really, I'm understating the problem. It's not just that these histories run along parallel tracks. Um, and as we know, parallel lines never meet or um, as, as a kid who was with me at nerd camp uh, for math in Northwestern 1983 would point out, they meet at infinity, which is like what Keynes said about the long run. You know, <laughs> they never meet. So, but I'm understating the problem. It's not just that they run on parallel tracks. It's that they're, they're magnetically opposed. It's not just they don't touch each other. It's that attempts to push them together meet with a certain kind of resistance. It's very difficult to put Polish and Jewish history together because each of them operate according to a kind of moralizing narrative where the other plays a certain necessary role. It's difficult to put Russian and Ukrainian or Belarusian and Polish or any of these combinations of national history together. And it's even more difficult to put Soviet and Nazi history together. You can read a lot of books about Soviet power or Soviet terror without realizing that these are happening in the same time and place as Nazi power and Nazi terror. You can read an awful lot about Nazi crimes without understanding that the, the, the very places, all of the places where the Germans committed their worst crimes were also ruled at one point or another from Moscow. Um, these regimes were in very intimate contact with each other, but our histories of them are written as though they were on different planets, essentially. And, and that's, that's a problem which has to be overcome. It's a problem which endures, I think, and will endure, because we understand the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany in terms of a binary view of the world, where, where one is on the right and one is on the left. And I think so long as that binary view of politics endures, um, this, this sense that they must somehow have been separate will remain. So these are some of the problems of, of trying to write a history 
let me give you a, a brief sense of what I thought I was doing when I brought all these things together, or how I tried to bring them all together. Some of the things that I did which were, I think, so conservative as to be radical again. I think the methods of this book are actually very straightforward. The, the first thing that I tried to do was to avoid metaphysics. So a Romanian colleague pointed out in, a, in, a, in an early Romanian language review that, that God appears in chapter 4, and that's true. So I don't perfectly avoid metaphysics. What I mean is that I try very hard in the book to avoid the secular metaphysics of, of the 20th century. Um, the kinds of, the, the, the ways of thinking about the world which, whether we like it or not, echo and resound through history writing in the 21st. The first thing that I tried to avoid was national exceptionalism. Most books about these subjects are written about Poles or Jews or Ukrainians or whoever it might be. My book is also about these people, but it doesn't start from the subject Polish history or Jewish history or Ukrainian history. It starts from the observation that 14 million human beings were killed. And that's actually a rather different starting point. It leads you to very different places. And it allows you to notice things, even about the national histories. This is a paradox that you won't notice if you just consider the national histories. And this is a point which is worth pressing. National history is the way that history is written, not just in my nationalism infested part of the world, but across the globe, including in US history, Canadian history, it doesn't really matter. It's all organized nationally. It's organized nationally even when we say it's not organized nationally. Um, there's a reason why the, the Library of Congress system is organized nationally. It's because that's the way we write. However, national history